Hello, and welcome to Zim Explore. I am Dr. Abstract, and in this Zim Explore, we're going to take a look at a matching game. Oh, how exciting is that? So, matching games are quite common, yet they can be conceptually tricky to code. Uh, let's see what we've got here. Ooh, ah, oh. Mm. Oh. oh, yes! I think I get it now. Oh, ah, yes! Oh, I can't believe it! I won the game! Ah. Okay, <laughs> so <laughs> they can be conceptually tricky to code once you actually get into them. So what we've done is we've made a template game here that you can put any number of objects up here that you want. They can be of any type. Uh, like a bunch of pictures, for instance, and then down here, maybe you've got some text down here and you're dragging that to the pictures. All right, yes, conceptually difficult. So the idea behind it, though, is to make, to make it uh, efficient, I suppose. Uh, the trick is to stop it from being tricky. The trick is you create them in order first. So all of the things you want to match go here and all of the things you want to match to go up there. And uh, they're in the proper order. And then what you do is you assign a property, a match property to this that is equal to the one that it matches, which would have been this one if they were in proper order. So the match property of this rectangle is that rectangle. And, and if you've got these in arrays, you just sort of match right up the indexes. But it's setting these objects as properties of these objects. Now, if you were to do a card matching game where you've got two sets of cards and you turn them over and see if they match, then what you do is you can set each card its, uh, its partner. In this case, where we're dragging the one thing, we only need to put the match on here. And then when we do a hit test, if we're hitting, our match, then we do that. If we're not hitting our match, then we do that. Um, whereas two cards, each of them would need a match because you don't know what which one you're picking up necessarily. But other, so they're similar in principle. <clears throat> you can apply that technique to both of these games. This one though is not the card matching game. This one is the oh, you know, dragging match game. <laughs> Shall we take a look at some code? I think so. Okay, so we'll reduce down here. We're in Zim. You can find Zim at zimjs.com. And you can find this example under zimjs.com slash explore, where all the explore examples are. Actually, too many explore examples are there. This one will be called matching game. All right, so we're bringing in Zim 10.9.0 and also pizzazz to make that backing striped pattern. If we come on down here, we've got the Zim frame, and there we are making the pizzazz backing stripe, stripe pattern just for some, some nice looking background. <laughs> okay, now we have um, two ways that we could have gone here with this example. We could have made it very basic, but we decided to sort of throw in all of the exciting things, or many of the exciting things that Zim can do to make this a little bit easier for us. However, you'll still see that there's a lot of code here. As a matter of fact, why don't we just take a review of the code before we jump right in and see what we're doing? All right, here's the, the things that we're going to be dragging. These are the objects. And then here's the array of the things where we're dragging to the targets. So you can see that if you had a new picture or an asset, it's called in Zim, it would be asset something, asset something, asset something. This could be label something, label something, label something, or whatever you want. This could be um, a sprite that's animating, and so could this, uh, or whatever, and they're finding their lost love. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> okay, so then we're looping through and setting the match. Now we'll come back and take a look at this specifically. Let's just go over, in a sense, the titles here. So we're looping through and setting the match objects. Then we're shuffling them. And we've got a couple ways to shuffle, so we'll take a look at that. Then we're putting them on the screen. So uh, before this, they were just in arrays. Now we're tiling them. We're tiling them in two sets of tiles on the screen. We're going to loop through and find out the starting positions of the objects we're dragging so that we can easily snap back to them. Then we're making a shape. This will help us draw the line. And here is where we mouse down. So when we mouse down, we record the current shape. 
And in the ticker, we draw the line. Now we had initially drawn the line in a press move event. So as we press and move the object, we, we kept on drawing the line. But when we let go of the line, or when we let go of the object, the object snaps back to its original position. And we want the line to be drawn as that is happening. So we can't do it on press move anymore because we had already let go. So we just put it in a ticker here. And how we're handling it is if there is a current shape that has been chosen, then we draw the line rather than drawing the line all the time, right? So that means our press up here is going to be responsible for setting the current shape to null, which it does there. Here it is doing the hit test to find out if the object we were dragging hits its match. And if that's the case, then we're doing some stuff. And if all of them have hit their match, then we end the game by doing that. Uh, otherwise, we are snapping back by doing that. <laughs> and um, then we've got the emitter here that's going to give us our reward, yes, and a replay button that we animate in if the, the game is over. The replay button has a lot of stuff in it because it has to do everything that we did in reverse. <laughs> so sometimes it's tricky to do a replay button. Well, it's always tricky to do a replay button, but sometimes we just do a cheat. We just reload the page and go to the matching game again. So with one line, you could have done that in the reset. But I thought I'd take you through the reverse of all of what we did. And then that's it, an icon. So that is the code. It may surprise you that there's more in there than you expected, but hopefully you see that each part of that is necessary to complete our game. That's how it is. Okay, so let's uh, start from the beginning then, shall we? We have two sets. We've got colors up top. Let's just take a quick review. Replay. Got two sets. We've got these guys up top and these ones here. These ones are called the objects and they're blue and we can drag them. And these ones are called the targets and they're pink, but otherwise they happen to be the same. So we're going to use Zim style, which is very much like CSS, as you can see. Uh, we're using Zim style because we can style these in, in a group rather than putting these values on our objects specifically. So uh, to start, we also have style that is generic. All this stuff is generic. You could, if you wanted to, say, well, I want to style the type of something, and that type would be a rectangle. And I want to style these styles right in here for the rectangle. And I want to style these ones in for the circle. So that's how you can be specific. You can also set a, uh, a group that's like a class. So a group, you can apply styles to groups. Anyway, there's another technique that you can use, and that is just to go very generic with your styles like this. And when you're done with your style, you can turn it off. So when we're done with those styles, we come on down here somewhere and we turn them off. That's it, or too far. <laughs> I think we missed it. <laughs> Turning it off. There we go. Styles are empty. No longer are we going to use them because then they'd be applied to things we don't want. So we were waiting until our, our um, tile was done. I think now, actually, I can probably pull that up. We had put all that stuff directly right in here in, in the tile, but then we decided to separate it out into two objects. So as long as we've got these objects created as they're created here, we can end the styles right, right there if we want. Oh, uh, yeah, I think we can. Yes, because we've got this move. So we did a little move, and I'll show you that. So here uh, we are saying that everything we make from now on is going to be blue, have a, a border color of dark and a border width of three. We're going to center reg them. And as a matter of fact, if we don't clone them, we can just center reg them and say true there. But um, let's keep it like this. And we'll discuss that in just a moment. OK, so we're doing that stuff to the first set. And all of that stuff would be done to the second set as well. But the second set, we want to be a different color. So uh, here we have the color of blue. What we do is we override that in a sense by saying, hey, the color of the style, please make that pink. So from now on, everything we make is going to be pink. And then this thing says, OK, <laughs> it's enough of that. None of those styles. We don't need them anymore. Let's uh, make sure that the label that we made for our title isn't pink <laughs> or whatever. <laughs> Turn off the styles. No more style. The end of style. Oh, the end of style. Um, 
Okay, so back to these guys, though, I suppose, a little bit. One problem with center reg, it's a problem and it's a blessing. <laughs> Is that how the phrase goes? It's a problem and it's a blessing. A blessing and a problem. <laughs> don't think so. Um, but anyway, it's nice to that center reg automatically centers things on the stage because most of the time we want that to happen. But sometimes, like if we're tiling something, let me just turn the clone off here and we'll talk about the clone in a minute. But if we're tiling something and we just said, yes, please add that to our center reg it true. And then uh, if we want to go tile it. Here's what happens. Are you ready? Let me refresh here. And oh, geez, you know, what are, what are all these things doing here? <laughs> so what's happened is this. Uh, the style said center reg it, which will by default add it to the center of the screen. There they are. The tile, by default, clones what it's going to be making. So the tile is used to just say, hey, please tile this circle and, and make 10 columns of them and 10 rows. And all of a sudden there's 100 circles. They've been cloned. So tile is set up to automatically clone. Therefore, tile goes off and clones these things. <laughs> but unfortunately, these things are just left here on the center of the stage. So by warning you and sort of saying in styles, quite often center reg, you might not want that to, well, not quite often, you know, half the time. It, unfortunately, it's about a half and a half thing. So center reg, we would say add colon false there. And that just tells the center reg a little bit more. You could also say what container you wanted to center reg it in here as well. But if we don't add it at this point, all it does is center the registration point. And then uh, the tiles down here, redoop, the tiles will be fine. See, they weren't made in the center. They were only made as we tiled. Now, with a clone of false, if we tell the tiles not to clone, we could have probably just left that as true. I leave that in there because it can be a very confusing bug if, you, if you're not made aware of it. So, heck, I just left it in there like that. Now, why are we cloning false? So the cloning has nothing really to do with each of these specifically, but is more a style, oh, that happens after, okay, now I see why we didn't move this one up here, is a style that happens um, to the tiles, which are down below here. So down after some things, we've got the tiles. There's our tile and our tile, and now we'll end our style. <laughs> tile, tile, end the style. There's one of those styles in there related to the tile, which is fine. This is telling the tile not to clone the objects. Now, why would we want the tile not to clone them? Or why would we want them to clone them? First of all, the cloning, even though, huh, scroll on, <laughs> up, down, up, down, up, down. Hopefully you're doing okay and not getting too dizzy. Here's the tile, and what we're doing is we're basically tiling those lists up above, but we're tiling them as a series, which means it does them in the order of the list. And that's handy if you wanted to tile a bunch of interface. You don't want it to, if you just tiled the array, so if you just tiled the array, like so, what you would be doing is randomizing. This is the ZIMV value, or the ZIMV way of randomizing something. Hey, pick from that tile. It's the ZIMPIC, ZIMVIC, uh, V, sorry, uh, ZIC, it's called. So that would be just pick from that array. Well, we don't want to do that. We don't want to randomize it. We've already randomized it, but perhaps in a special way. We've randomized it in a way that, that um, isn't exactly the same <laughs> as this stuff below. So we don't want to re-randomize it here. Anyway, so we're running it in a series. Uh, of course, if we were <laughs> making a bunch of interface in the series, we obviously don't want to randomize our interface. So the series here, like so, if the series does it in order. And that's great. If we had cloning on, it would still do it in order. And if we had, uh, right now, we've sort of limited our tile to be three things in the columns and one row. If we went something like three by three here, let's take a look at that. Which one is this? This is the targets. So we'll have to wait for those to animate in. We refresh. Uh, here they are. So this is what happens when we have clone turned off. The tile goes and makes the, the first three of them. And then when the tile goes to make the next three, 
It doesn't clone them, it just uses them over again. So it puts them here. And then the tile goes to make the last three for the third row. And it just uses them again. It puts them here, here, and here. So that's what it would look like with cloning turned off. It just uses them over and over again. Let's pop on up and set the cloning, uh, allow the cloning, which by default is true. So turn that on. And now it will clone. And we get this. There they are cloned with no vertical spacing. Okay, so we, we may want to clone a series like this. But if we, uh, in our case, we don't want to clone it. And the, the reason why we don't want to clone it is when you clone something, you lose its custom properties. Got that? So things have properties to start, and those get cloned. Things like X, Y, alpha, um, the size thing, or the, the scale, scale X, scale Y. Um, so those will get cloned for you. But any custom properties that we add, such as, hey, which ones match? <laughs> if, we, if we put a matching thing on there, clone has no idea that it, it's supposed to clone that. So it doesn't clone it, and we would lose all our matching. So a solution to that would be to place them there, and leave the clone on, place them there, and then afterwards loop through them and apply our matching. But by that time, these ones have all been sorted in the wrong order, so it may be more difficult. Anyway, uh, a solution is just to not clone them. If you don't clone them, you don't lose the custom properties. And by the way, that includes events. So quite often, we're tiling interfaces. And those interfaces, we want to put the events on the interfaces, like have you clicked the button? Uh, is the dial changing? Those are all events that we put on those interfaces. If we're tiling those, we don't want to clone because it, we would lose all those events. We'd have to apply those events after the tiling. So the solution is to not clone. Uh, if you want something unique there, especially if it has properties that we've added after. Okay, have we described that? Okay. <laughs> um, is there anything that we can do about that? Well, as I've shown you, this half the time we want to tile and we want, might want to clone, and the other half maybe we don't. So it's sort of like, um, can't quite tell. We could possibly work out a way to clone and clone custom properties. We actually have that, so we could apply that type of clone. can't remember what we call that. It's like a clone, but it's called duplicate or something like that. So we could possibly look into uh, duplicating. I'm just not sure that's the best thing to do because um, uh, maybe you don't want to duplicate things that are unique to an object. You know what I mean? Uh, they're already unique to the object, and as we tile them, we're now making them not unique anymore. Okay, anyway. Enough of that. Uh, it is a Zim Explorer, though, so at some point, sometimes we can explore these philosophical aspects of code. This, these are the thoughts that have to go, uh, or that we have to do to um, create something like Zim to make things work for you as easily as possible. All right, have we have we finished the first little block of code here? <laughs> you know, twenty minutes later. <laughs> Uh, this is going to be some explorer, isn't it? So you are always welcome with these explorers to put it on pause, go grab a cookie or a donut or a smoothie with some, some kale in it, and then come on back and hit it again. Everything that we talk about here will be useful, I am sure, as you go through and code with Zim. It's a wonderful world, and hopefully these tips will be good. All right, so are we back to order here? We've, uh, we've got the add false, we've got the clone, great. We have our objects here, triangles we had to make a little bit bigger. We set the style for these ones to be pink. One thing you could do is not do the style there, and we could have done it all right here with a series, like so. So you can put things into a series in the style, and that would be blue, blue. We'll make it green, green green here. So do you, can you see what's going to happen? The first object that gets made, because this is so generic and we haven't specified the type, first object that gets made is going to be blue, the second one's going to be blue, the third one's going to be blue, the fourth one's going to be green. Let's have a look. 
Uh, I can't remember if we, uh, okay, we've still got the columns in there. So there they are, blue ones and green ones. And we've got to come down here. And what was it that we were doing? Oh, yes, one. So one row, not, uh, three columns, one row, if you want. Great. And by the way, these things don't all have to be like that. This could be purple, for instance, or wood, you know, whatever you, you want. And now we've got blue, purple, blue, and then three green ones come in. However, I don't think we'll do that. So we will undo that. <laughs> We're not going to do it. We're going to undo it. Leave that as blue and bring this back down below saying from now on, they'll be pink. And so they are. Great. How do we set up our matching? Well, that's pretty easy. We loop through the objects list. Now it makes, I think, more sense, although perhaps it's equal. Maybe it's equal. Anyway, I, I like to put the matching property on the object that we're dragging. Yes, I think that is more important because uh, otherwise you'd have to find out. Yeah, uh, that's that's the case, because we, we know which one we picked up. So as we pick something up, we know the object we picked up, therefore put its match on that object. And it's the objects list one right here, <clears throat> the objects list one, these guys that we're picking up and dragging. So we loop through those, we get an object each time, that will be the whatever the rectangle, circle, triangle thing. And then we set up its match. So object.match is a custom property that we're adding to the object. And uh, we are um, doing its match based on an index. So we're grabbing the index as well as we loop. And because these match, see how it matches? Zero, zero, one, one, two, two. They don't have to be the same thing. Initially, we did these, hey, if the type of thing that we dropped is a rectangle and the type of thing we dropped it on is a rectangle, then they match. But that would mean that you'd have to have a type property, which we do for shapes, but which we don't if, you're, if you've got custom images or something. So we wanted to set this up in a way that it will work with any types of objects. And here it is. This is how you do it. You put the objects in an array like that. You match them up before you, uh, before you mix up the array. You could mix up both of these now, and we'd be fine. We're only going to mix up the one. We're going to mix up the targets. And here we are shuffling the targets. Now, initially, we just shuffled the targets right here. Then we realized when we did the reset, we had to reshuffle the targets. We wouldn't have had to reset, reshuffle the targets if we just reloaded the page, because it would then have done the shuffling right here. But because in the reset, we need to shuffle, and here we need to shuffle, we put shuffle into a function. It's fine to put it into the function if you run it just once anyway because this function says I'm doing something and it help, helps you organize. But if we didn't have that reset, uh, the reset, we maybe could have just left all this here like that. We could have said, here we are shuffling. <laughs> all right, as it stands now, we put it into a function and that function ends right here. We did shuffling in two ways. Let's have a look. It's a little bit more complicated than you think. Um, we basically want to make sure that these, that when once we shuffle the array, that the array is different in a different order than uh, the other array. So what we've done, oh crap, we use types. Oh, sorry. Uh, well, maybe we'll have to modify that. <laughs> Do you, do you see what do you see what we've done? We're we're using the type of it to find out if those are the same. After I just told you we're making this generic so that you don't have to worry about the types. Uh, what would that require then? We've shuffled them, and we want to know that they've been shuffled into a different order. Well, um, hmm. yeah. What we should do then, I think, is. I think there'd be a way to do that. It'd be tricky though, because we'd have to find out the types. Um, yeah, we'd have to probably throw them into an object literal, shuffle them based on the ID that we give in the object literal, and then bring them out or index them or something. There, there's there's bound to be a way, and I thought we actually had in Zim a unique shuffle ability. I, I know that I've made uh, 
uh, a function to do that in the past, like a little helper function to shuffle something and arrive at something that is now unique in order. You can look that up if you need it. We may apply something, probably it would work out well in series. Imagine that this could be a series and we say series shuffle unique or something and then all of a sudden it will give you the same series in a different order. So that's what you're looking for. We do have shuffle, but the problem with shuffle is it's, it's, I think, maybe shuffle always comes back unique. I can't remember. Uh, it doesn't have, I, I looked at shuffle to see if shuffle had a unique parameter. That would be another place to put it. It would make sense. Where you shuffle and it has to come back in a different order than when it left. Right now, I don't think our shuffle actually does that. Uh, it just randomly shuffles and it might randomly appear to be the same. So a little bit of work to do there. Sorry, why don't we just ignore that for now. Right now we can take a look at how we did it with, with the types. So that, that's what we were doing to find out if it changed. Right, so a zim loop. This is a zim loop right here, right here, Oop, loop. And that loop will return true if it finishes. So um, what we're going to do, if this loop finishes, it would be true, and true would be put into same. So if it's the same loop, we're going to keep on looping if it's the same loop, because we don't want it to be the same loop. So what we do is if it's the same loop, we're going to, oh, sorry, uh, we're going to loop. We're going to find out if it's the same, but if it's the same, we're going to shuffle. And then it runs the while again. So after it hits the bottom, it runs while. Now, shouldn't we just shuffle to start? I think we want to shuffle at the beginning. Yeah, because it's going to loop through. Well, it happens to be the same, so I suppose we would want to shuffle it. And then it keeps on moving. Yeah, we probably want to put this at the beginning. <laughs> so if it's same, shuffle. Um, yeah, but how do we uh, know it's not the same? Oh, right. Yeah, I think that works. And we just want to shuffle to the beginning. Something like a little brain teaser, huh? Why isn't that tab hitting me to the right place? It's these guys. Uh, erg. Uh, okay, fine. Be like that then. So while it's the same, if it's the same shuffle, uh, well, we don't need that anymore. So while it's the same shuffle, and then as we loop through here, if it ends up coming through the loop uh, properly, then that will be true, and therefore it'll loop again. But what will make it false is if we actually return false here if the objects are different. So we're checking to see, we're looping through the target list and getting the object each time. We're also collecting the i for the index because we're needing to compare two things in the list. So object, um, if the object's type, and this would be rectangle, circle, or triangle, again, difficulty. We'd have to compare maybe an ID or something else later, but I'll leave that for now. So if the object's type is not equal to the other one, uh, our object is from the target list, and this one happens to be the object's list type. So if those two things are different, we return false. And by returning an object from this loop, uh, by returning something from the loop, we end the loop, and whatever we've returned gets put in there. So same would be false. If same is false because these things are different, then we don't we no longer do the while. So while loops are always hard to describe. Uh, I think the best way to do it is describe it once, and then you just have to listen to it again if you don't get it. <laughs> or to just sit here describing it over and over again. It's always just as confusing. <laughs> okay, and there we go. So that's the while loop. It works. Uh, maybe I won't even bother. We're running a little low on time here. Maybe I won't bother with the while loop for here, but you can have a look at that. This is the reverse. This is actually making sure that everything is in a different place. And when you've only got three things, that's kind of boring because then there's only a couple arrangements and you refresh a page and half the time it doesn't, doesn't change because it's the same arrangement as it was before. So uh, for many things that might be good. That, that would make sure that none of, your, uh, none of your objects matches up to another 
uh, object right away. You know what I mean? If we refresh this, <laughs> did we? I don't think we saved it. This one matches, but these guys don't. So that's okay. But we d we could set it up so that even this one couldn't match. That uh, triangle, I guess, would have to be there. We did save it. What's going on with our targets? Three and three. Well, I've got back to three again. Okay, so it's back to one. Back to one. Now we should be good. There we are. Maybe we didn't undo or something. Okay, so I can't even remember what we're doing now. Can you? We went through some matches. What an explorer. I love it when you explore so much that. <laughs> Where am I? Where's that Henry Moore sculpture? <laughs> Am I in an English garden? Oh my goodness. No, no, no. Wait a minute. I was talking here on the computer. Right. Okay. Uh, right. Exploring. Um, so, targets. Why do we see the word targets here? Ah, here we are doing the tiling. Ladies and gentlemen, Zim Explore. We're tiling our, our list for the targets. Three columns, one row, and a hundred spacing, horizontal spacing. We're positioning it down a little bit, setting its alpha, and animating that in after a little wait. And then here, we're just putting this one directly in there, although we could animate that in, say, from the left. We could animate its X. So this is the objects list that we're tiling now, in much the same way, except we put a drag on that. And isn't it nice? Like So some of the things we were saying, yes, we were going to show you some of the nice efficiencies of Zim. Well, this is actually a nice efficiency of, of a container in CreateJS and, I suppose, of Zim. We put a drag on the whole container, and yet it actually drags just the thing in the container. So we don't have to worry about putting a drag on each one of them. If we wanted to drag the whole container, we would say all colon true there and it would drag the whole container. Boom, boom, boom. I don't know what would happen afterwards. Probably broken in the code. Okay, so that's how you would drag all of the container, but but just putting a drag on it will drag anything in the container. So once again, if we had 100 of these things, hey, no problem, this code works. This would be 100. 100 and 100. You might want to <laughs> reduce the spacing on that, <laughs> unless you got a really big monitor. Okay, um, well, the resolution. We've turned off the style, so the stuff that we make afterwards, and, and they don't get the style. Good so far? Time for that cookie break, right? Great. All right, we shall persevere. We'll carry on after this drink of apple juice. Everybody, drink your apple juice. <clears throat> okay, so record the starting locations. We want to be able to snap back, so we're going to loop through all of the objects. Now, what the heck are the objects? Ah, right, okay, so it's a little bit different now. Targets are the targets, and that's what we're clicking to. Where'd the objects go? They're underneath here. Objects are the objects, so it's no longer object list and target list, or objects list and targets list. It's targets and objects. I like working with the, you know what I mean, if, if we had called the list targets and objects, then what would we call these things? And these are the things we're actually going to be working with more. So I like, I like calling the things that we're working with, the actual objects, the base name. Targets. Objects. Okay, so we're looping through our objects, and each time we get an object from, from there, and we're setting the start x to the objects x. Now there are people out, when you come from other languages, you'll be doing this in an array. You're used to doing this type of stuff in an array. Where do we start? Oh, let's store that in an array. You don't have to. We have an object here. You can store it right on the object as a property of the object. If you think about it, the start position of an object is a property of that object. So make it simple on yourself. Don't start up an array to remember where the start x's are and the start y's are. <laughs> Heaven forbid an array of arrays. <laughs> okay, don't do that. Just um, store them right on the object that we have. This is the rectangle to start, the circle, and the triangle. So here the start x is equal to the object's current x. All right, great. 
done. Now when we pick something up and drag it, we can just ask what's its start x. We don't have to look it up in an array based on an index, etc. All right. So there's the uh, locations that we're going to snap back to. And actually, also, when we restart the whole thing, we'll put them back to these start positions as well. Create the shape where we're going to draw the line. We do create the shape. At this moment, though, the shape would be above everything, and you would get something that looks a little ugly. You want to see it? So that's what we did. We get something a little ugly, and then we fix it. So here is what that would look like. There they are. And well, maybe you want that. There is the shape when it is the last thing made. So do you see that? The last thing made. Interesting. I think that tells me that we didn't clear the shape properly. I think I remember seeing it in the codes. We're going to have to fix that up. You see a little snaggle there. Okay. <coughs> Excuse me. Let me do that right now. Ticker. So if there's a current shape, when we drop it, which is here, the press up, we want to clear the current shape. There we've cleared it if we're hitting. We have to wait for it to snap back. And there it is when we... So we did set the current shape to null, but we didn't clear the graphics. So here is the shape.clear. We're going to see this later when we match. And here is, well, that doesn't matter if it's, I thought we were drawing the graphic, but I can see that we're not drawing the graphic. Well, we didn't clear the shape. Uh, that's no big deal. Because it's in behind, we can't see it anyway. Whatever. Whatever. So the point was, though, when we make that shape, right here, we want to put it <clears throat> down below. Now, have we put it down below far enough? <clears throat> Sorry about that. Um, if we went to the bottom, it would be bad. Here's what dot bot looks like. Because you know what's at the bottom, right? Oh, you almost can't tell, but you can tell. If it's at the bottom, it's uh, on. T it's underneath those uh, the stripes. Not that it matters too much, but it is also underneath those shapes, which is bad. So you don't want that because see what happens. It disconnects. It's, well, wait a minute. What's going on? I thought this thing was connected to the triangle. How, how are you doing this magic trick? <laughs> the type of magic we don't want. So we don't want it at the bottom because that's under all that stuff. So we just want underneath the last thing we made, which was the triangle, which was the tile for the triangle, the rectangle, and the circle. Those are all in a tile is a container. It holds those three things. So uh, we don't want bottom. We just want ord minus one, which changes the order by minus one. It puts it uh, back towards the bottom. And uh, then we get this. It's underneath this one, but above those ones. So there, that's fine. And now we are picking up, we're, we're recording this variable called current shape that will help us draw only if we're picking up the current shape. So we're saying the current shape is the e dot target, whatever we mouse down on, e dot target. Now remember, this is objects. So once again, we have an efficiency put in place by our coding environment. This, this one basically is JavaScript coding environment. We had it back in Flash too where uh, you can click on an object and get its e.target. That's actually what was clicked on, as opposed to e.currentTarget, which is the tile itself, the container for the tile. So e.target would be whatever inside the tile we clicked on, and we're storing that as current shape. In our ticker, which runs over and over again really, really fast, we say if we have a current shape, then I had made this code with an object in mind already, so I'm just sort of transferring current shape. Otherwise, we wouldn't have to, and it would be current shape, current shape, mm, current shape, current shape, current shape, current shape, like so. And I looked at this and went, well, well maybe not. <laughs> so <laughs> current shape's a long variable <laughs> when you're using it a lot. So I just left it how I had already coded it and just put the current shape in object. Great, no problem. And, and now we can say uh, there's a tricky bit here in that the objects are inside of the tile and the tiles are located. Well, I'll show you where the tiles are. Here's targets and there is 
the objects and we'll go dot outline like this outline okay so outline is a zim way of showing you where stuff is so that's where they are looks like we didn't quite get that triangle to be the right size <laughs> close um, anyway that's where the tile containers are so here right here that's the origin that's a zero zero so this triangle is i don't know 50 over and whatever down and, and so forth so that's these positions yet as we pick this thing up the line that we pick up right here the line uh is on the stage its coordinate system is right here at zero zero so we need to we're trying to draw the line from where the um where the rectangle is uh to where it's going like that and yet the rectangle is in a coordinate system inside of this little guy zero zero so we can't just say draw the line from wherever this thing is because it's going to start drawing way up here okay and that's confusing for many people it's a coordinate system thing now some solutions to that we could have put the line inside of this tile then they would share the same coordinate system but um, you run the risk at later date of wanting to loop through the tile to gain access. We've got a drag on there, so we'd have to stop. Like That would also make the line be draggable. I'm not sure what would happen there. So usually if you've got a tile of, of shapes, just keep it a tile of shapes. Don't put anything else in there. It can cause problems later. So we're not putting anything else in there. Other possibilities. We could have put the shape at the same X and Y as this. And we would have to make sure that it's the same scale as that and a variety of other things scale rotation all that stuff would mess it up so rather than that we have learned to use local to global global to local and local to local these are ways to shift coordinate systems shift between coordinate systems so here we are using that now i don't want to outline these guys anymore no more outline all right, so back to the coordinate systems. What we're doing is we're saying, hey, um, we've got this object, and I want to know what the local position of the object in its parent, so the object is sitting in the tile, uh, what its local position is to global. So I want to find out where its start x is, because the start x is also local to the, the tile. When we asked for it, we asked for the object's x. That was the object's x in the tile. So we need to convert that start x to a global, and same with the start y. So we're converting these two local points within the parent to a global point here so that we can draw to it. And same with the current x and y as well are inside the object's parent. Okay, that's a coordinate system of the tile. So we're going to, you know, you can actually use zero, zero here sometimes and get rid of parent and use just, where is zero, zero? It doesn't work all the time. It works for a circle where zero, zero is in the center of the circle, but it won't work for a rectangle when the rectangle is center ridged and the zero, zero is at the top left corner of the rectangle. So anyway, the, the best, the most consistent way is to ask, where am I? Where's my X and Y? inside the parent. And we get two points. Now we can draw from the shape. So here's normal shape drawing. We're clearing it each time. Otherwise, if you don't clear it each time, it actually looks kind of cool. We want to see what that looks like in this explore. So we're constantly, the ticker is constantly drawing there. There it cleared itself. Boink. Check out the bounce. It draws the line on the bounce too. So um, anyway, that's not what we want. So we're clearing the line each time. We're setting its stroke and stroke size. Um, and we are then moving to the first points x and y in the global coordinate system and drawing a line to the second points in the global thing. It's so easy. Okay, so there it is. Sorry if it didn't seem easy to you, but once, once you look at it a little bit, it is actually pretty easy. All right, just set the color, set the stroke, move to this place. That's what this means, move to this point and line to that point. Okay, and you get dynamic drawing. That's what we're doing constantly in the ticker if there is a current shape. 
when we press up, we are, we've now let go. So now we're pressing up. Uh, by the way, I don't know. Uh, are we using the most recent Zim? I can't remember. Yeah, I've left it as Zim 9. We're working on Zim Cat. There's some fun things in Zim Cat. One of the things in... Oop, did I say the name of it? Oh, Zim 10.9.1. <laughs> it's no longer... We've run out of... We've run out of points. So we're no longer calling it Zim 10 anymore. We're going to be launching that. That'll probably... It's a big launch, so it'll probably come out in about a month. But in that one, we have a uh, note that this is a press up. We have a press move. And this is a mouse down. And it's just really annoying to have a mouse down and a press up. So we're introducing a press down. <laughs> you can still use mouse down. <laughs> but we've actually got a press down and press up. But that's in the next version. We've been now working in 10, well, in, in the new version. We've been working in that for a little bit. So we're, yeah. uh, we also animate in seconds. <laughs> that's been tricky. Uh, right now we're animating in milliseconds, but we've, we've changed to animate in seconds. To I think that's easier for most people, and Greensock does it. Not, no, we're not doing it because of Greensock, but they do it, so that's good. That, that means that you know there's two of us anyway, or a few more probably. Um, but it's just for you know kids and stuff. Hey, kids, uh, this is going to be 300 milliseconds, and they go, uh, <laughs> is that a bug? <laughs> like a millipede. <laughs> So uh, anyway, there there goes teaching kids about milliseconds. Darn. Uh, so coming back here, yeah. So <laughs> that would be 0.2 seconds. All right, where'd we get to then? Is this where we are? Hit test. No, not at the hit test yet. Pressing up. Right, almost here. So right, hit test. Yeah, okay, close enough. So we're finding out which object we're pressing up on. That will be the shape that we're dragging. And then if that object hits the bounds of its match, so this is the object match, see what I mean? We don't have to do anything. Is the current object hitting its own match? We don't have to do any index lookups or any hocus pocus comparing of IDs or looping through something and finding out if this is this is this is this. We've already got it. This is what we're testing to hit, and we're stored it right on the object. So see how easy that makes it? Okay, um, if it does match, then we're going to take the object and locate it at the same place as the match. Or we could animate it to the object.match.x and object.match.y. But here we're just going to locate it there. We remove the, the mouse. We could also remove the drag. Uh, but the drag is put on the container. So it's a tricky situation to be able to do that. I'm not even sure if we can do that, actually. Uh, normally, if you needed to remove the drag, you would have to loop through the container and apply the drag to each one so that we could individually remove the drag. But the alternative is just to set its no mouse. So that sets its mouse children and its mouse enabled to false, um, and then puts them back again if, if need be. Uh, although circle, rectangle, and triangle already have their mouse children false, so that you don't pick up a shape that's inside the container that holds them. <laughs> I think I've been working with Zim too long. <laughs> what do you think? <laughs> okay, so uh, if I if I knew the real world as well as I do, <laughs> no Zim, that would be something else. Okay, um, so we're not letting the user pick up the mouse or. <laughs> You can't pick up that mouse anymore. Now I'm just getting silly. We're let, not letting the user pick up the object once it's once it's matched. We remove the match. These things are all optional. You can leave it there if you want or whatever. Uh, we are making the emitter. We're locating it at the object. Isn't that lovely? I love the loc. And you just put in loc at it at there. You can put in loc uh, obj.x, obj.y. Come in. Hmm. I'm sure, I thought there was a knock at the door, but maybe it was just a rattle. Um, <laughs> you better stop yelling. <laughs> We're all at home these days. <laughs> okay, so emitter.loc at the object, and then we're spurting that emitter 10. Do you want to see if, it, if we spurt at 100? <laughs> what happens? Because this is supposed to be an explorer. What kind of fun are we having if, it's, if we can't make it a, a spurt? Ah, missed. Ah, missed. 
<laughs> yep, we got it. <laughs> so what do you think about that? Oh, what reward we're getting. Uh, yeah, it's still, still going on. <laughs> okay. Anyway, there it is uh, at 100. You can also say how long to spurt for. If you really, if that's not enough spurt for you, you can do things like here's our emitter here. There's our emitter, and we might want to do something like the num of 10. So this would be 10 particles for, oh, but it's going to still just do, um, not that one, it's just still just going to do 20 up here. If you take a look, where is our spur? Or 10. So this will just do 10 really quick. It'll be like one quick spurt. The other one was already quick, but that is, you see how they're they're all kind of at once, poof, like that. It's like a bit of an explosion spurt. But then we could go with a hundred, and it will um, it will spurt for the same amount of time, but just more stuff. What do I? I want to save this one and load that. One. Okay, refresh. So you ready? <laughs> <laughs> Great. Uh, so it depends on what kind of spurt you want. And there's various other things you can do with the emitter. So many things. You don't want gravity. You don't have to have gravity. I don't want 10 of them. And just while we're down here, we're, we're spurting a circle randomly. Those colors right there with a border of dark. Uh, uh, you could also, right now it's set up to just spurt the circle or circles. I was concerned that maybe they should have matched the shape. Like for if we matched a rectangle, spurred a bunch of rectangles. In the end, you're not going to have rectangles and triangles anyway, so I didn't bother changing it. <clears throat> Excuse me. But we could have done that. What you'd have to do is spurt a function. So this, this whole thing right here would have been a function. And that function would have read which object we just dropped. Or when we pick up the object, the current object, it would see if it's a type of a triangle, then we would spurt triangles if it's a type of rectangle. We could even spurt clones of the object that we picked up, that kind of thing. That would go into function right here, and we pass the function in as the object. A function is also a zimv value, which means uh, it will just run the function, and the result of the function it will use. So that really opens up, opens up zim in many cases to be completely flexible. Um, in terms of its parameters. I suspect that that's what functional programming is. We're passing in a function and getting an object from that function. That function can actually call more functions and the results of those can be used in arrays in those functions or in series in the functions. And, and those can all be series. It just like goes on forever with series, arrays, and functions nested and it will calculate them all and return back the, the right answer that you want right here in your emitter. <laughs> We've made custom snowflakes and all sorts of things in the emitters in this manner. Okay, but that is a way as well to emit things like uh, change the color based on something else. You just emit a function and that function checks the color of something else and therefore emit something of that color. Alrighty. Any idea where we were? We did the shape. Good. Right here. Uh, yeah, we're pressing up the emitter, yay! And we clear the shape, so that, that, that goes away. Right, we don't, if we didn't clear the shape, I'm, oh, current shape, current shape to null, would that do it? Maybe it doesn't do it. I think the current shape is just saying don't draw anymore. It doesn't actually say otherwise clear the shape. Let's try it. There we go. <laughs> This will clear the shape because that's drawing a new shape. Boop. Hmm. <laughs> Not bad. So probably important that we clear the shape. And also set the current shape to null so we're no longer drawing a shape. We wouldn't notice, I don't think, but this would constantly be drawing a shape even if we're not doing anything. So this, this runs all the time. So we don't want that processing in behind there. And we are, oh, testing to see if we're ending the game. So does the targets, is the number of children in the targets equal to zero? So if there's nothing left in the target, because we're removing things from the target, aren't we? Where does that happen? 
get removed from. So the object.match gets removed from. So we're removing things from that tile, uh, just called objects. And if there's none left, then we end the game. Now you can create your own custom counter for that and start counting things. You could have also uh, used uh, the Zim game module and thrown up a score up there on the right hand side. Use the score. Oh, now we have this many. Or you could have an indicator that keeps track of how many things there are that you've gotten right or wrong. Indicators are great for that. Uh, or you can just count the number of children and end the game when it's done. You don't need a custom variable for that. We have that information already. <coughs> And then we animate in uh, the object. So, we're, oh yeah, we're, we're, this is a kind of a cute thing. Now, you don't have to do this either, but it just made it so much fun. I actually don't mind playing this matching game. I, I like playing this matching game. Can you believe it? I'm such a loser. I actually like playing this because I like seeing the particle emitters and I like seeing them go boing it boing it boing it <laughs> You know, I keep playing this, <laughs> and it's a you know, it's like a kindergarten game, but I like playing it uh, because of this little animation right here. Now, just watch what we're doing. We're animating the objects, which is the whole container. It's the whole tile that we're animating there, and we're adjusting its scale and looping it twice. So looping it twice and rewinding it. So that means it goes in and out, in and out really quickly. But here is the trick. If, if we did that, it looks really bad without a sequence. If we did it without a sequence, it looks awful. Do you want to see it? You, want to see it? you probably don't really want to see it look so bad. This, uh, now watch this, when I do this, is going to scale the container. Now remember, the container is actually back down here. So when it scales it, it looks like this. <laughs> okay. Nope. So as it scales it, this is where it's scaling it from down here. So it scales up and out kind of thing. And it's scaling the whole container because that's what we've asked for. But if we set it to a sequence, then it scales the things inside the container. And indeed, you can also set a sequence of zero, which would um, do them so quickly that they would look like they're just all scaling together. So here's what that would look like. Okay, boom, boom. It looks they're all scaling individually, but at the same time. However, I like the sequence too. So, and you can play around with sequence numbers and times, and that gets a different effect. Great. So I love the Zim sequence. It's really cool. Uh, Replay.add2. So here we are animating in the replay button. Great. Else, if there's no match and we haven't won the that's that's if we've um, won the game and there's a match here. So if there's a match, we haven't won the game yet. Uh, it just does this part. If there's no match, so we come on down here and we're not matching, then we want to set the objects to, oh, while we're moving it back down and animating the object back down, we don't want to try and pick up another object because that would sort of mess things up with the, the shape that's being drawn. It's not the end of the world, but all of a sudden you get this object that's animating back and it's got this red line going to it. it, looks great. But you pick up another object, the red line would go to the other object, and the object animating back would not have a red line. And we don't want that. So we're setting all of the objects so that they can't be picked up. That's the container, we can't pick them up. Then we're animating down the objects, and when we finish the animation, so here's the call, when we finish the animation, we turn the mouse back on for all of the objects. We say, I've no longer got a current shape, so stop drawing the line, and we clear that shape. So we're animating uh, the object back to its start position as well. Now we don't have to worry about converting the start position because we're animating an object that's in the same coordinate system as its start position. It's the same object in the same coordinate system of its tile. And there's the time. We added the elastic in out. You want to see what it looks like in the default ease? It's just not quite the same. It's not bad. And maybe you prefer it. Some people do. Oh, I have to miss. Right? It just puts it back. Puts it back. Doesn't put it back. With the elastic, all of a sudden, you've got something that just looks a little bit more professional. And it's just about as easy to do. Boing! <laughs> Uh, what you can do is, oh, I just saw a bug. See that? You don't want that. 
that might be hard to, uh, you would actually have to start, you, you put that triangle back into some other container on the stage temporarily and then move it back in. Because right now, um, you don't want to just add it to the these guys because we're checking the number of children. Anyway, so small book. Um, what was it that we were saying? Oh, yes. You could change the, the time on that elastic and make it look a little bit better with the time being larger. I prefer this elastic right here. Refresh. Oh, maybe even that's too much. So you see how it's a little bit slower, right? But it just happened there. It's so slow that I want to pick up the next one. And I can't. I can't pick it up yet until that elastic is done. It was just too much waiting and a little bit bothersome. So we have to keep it smaller. We can actually set an equation in here for uh, or ease equations. How do, I, how do I do that? Ease. Anyway, that's coming up in the uh, in the next version of Zim, where we bring back these equations that they were traditionally in CreateJS. We hadn't realized that we sort of lost them as we moved over into moved our animation into the Zim animation, but we figured out a way to bring them back, where you can tweak that elastic to make it uh, be elastic -y how how you want. <laughs> okay, we better move along here. We're trying to keep all our Zim explorers to an hour, and I think we've just past an hour. Yeah, we're an hour and one minute if I look over there. But we're pretty well done aside from the replay. There's the emitter. <clears throat> Talked about that already a bit. Here's the replay button. It's a button that we positioned but then removed it so that we can animate it in later. And when we tap on it, we're going to uh, remove the button. So that removes the button once we tap on it. We're going to loop through the objects and animate them back to their start position. So these are the ones that are now in the successful position up above. We're animating them back down and then turning back on the mouse. So remember, we had turned each individual mouse is off. And when we bring it back down, we want to then, once we've animated them back down, turn it on. We're now here's the tricky bit, this little bit here. We're reshuffling the target list. Uh, this one caught me for a while. I had been calling shuffle targets thinking it would work, but the shuffle targets were already acceptable, and so it just kept on leaving them in the right place. So you have to shuffle the targets so that they might be in the wrong place, and then call shuffle the targets, <laughs> which will um which will check to make sure that the shuffle is in the right place. <laughs> so, there was a little bit of a schmozzle, that one. We're um, removing all of the targets from the, the screen. So this stuff uh, was shuffling the target list. This thing right here is the tile of the targets, and we're getting rid of those. We're turning back off the clone. Be careful here because we closed our style, therefore clones back to default true. So we're turning back off the clone and remaking tiles from our list. So that remakes the tiles. Otherwise, you can't really reorganize the stuff in the tiles. It can, but it's just not worth it. So we're basically getting rid of the old tile, making a new tile. When we do so, we have to remember to turn our cloning back off so that we keep our matching and you know that stuff. Actually, I don't even know if we have any matching properties on there. We <laughs> probably don't. <laughs> We'd be okay to clone it. No, because those are the objects that we stored. So, oh, be very careful there, right? We actually stored a reference to those objects in the... Uh, in, in the uh, we stored a reference to the targets in the objects that we're dragging. So if we clone the targets, they would actually be different objects. They, they look the same. It's a rectangle, but it's a different rectangle than the one we stored in the in the property, the match property. So we definitely have to turn our cloning off, and we run that again the same way that we did before, and we're animating them back in. We make the icon the matching game. We're done. All right, wow, that's pretty amazing. What do you guys say? Was that exciting for you? In this Zim Explore. I am Dr. Abstract. That was a long one. Not only that, I'm going to be doing another one. <laughs> yeah, sometimes people come along and they just they, they want to see how something is built. 
we're a sucker at Zim. We we like building things, and it helps us work work through stuff as well, keep everything up to date. So we're so happy that you're here. If you're still listening to this, come visit us at zimjs.com/slack. I am Doctor Abstract. Ciao.